Hi guys, um, I had another discussion video that I wanted to post today um, going over the discussion six exercise. You can hopefully recall that that is about the trip and lack operons. Um, and there was a few scenarios given um, trying to get you to predict what would happen underneath um, various conditions. I wanted to go over this because I think that people are having some hard times um, conceptualizing dual regulation in particular. So I just wanted to overview it so that people can feel more confident with the lack operon in particular. Um, so first of all, just a hint that for the exam, you won't actually be expected to differentiate between low and very low transcription, which I think on the worksheet it did. So just remember, like when you're studying, try not to um, focus too much on that low, very low. If you understand the distinction between those two, that's great and that's awesome, but um, ultimately high versus low should be what you focus most of your time and energy on. So before we get into the scenarios, I wanted to just kind of remind you of the structure of the lac operon and what that really means. So you remember that we have this um, coding sequence that coded for that repressor protein. And repressor proteins are an example of negative regulation and you can, or an inhibitor. Um, and you can kind of remember that because um, essentially like under normal conditions where you don't have the repressor protein, you'll have like a baseline level of transcription. But if you add that repressor, you're suddenly gonna get that transcription dropping. So it's essentially like a net negative in the transcription that's happening because of that repressor protein. Um, but we also had an additional regulator, um, which can be seen here, the CRP-CAMP binding site, which in this operon acts as an activator. So an activator is an example of a type of positive regulation. And you can remember that because it's like, okay, if you have a baseline level of not very much transcription, but then it's activated and you're getting a lot of transcription happening because of that, you're getting that net positive because of the regulator. So that's how you can remember that. So we're getting these, um, we have these two types of regulation and they're working simultaneously and in opposite directions of each other. And I think that's why people have some troubles because they're like, how do we determine what the net effect of these things are? Um, so remembering the particular relationship with lactose in this case is that the repressor protein, that's always gonna be transcribed. We're always gonna be making it. And in its default state, it's going to want to bind to the DNA which will physically block the RNA polymerase. And so transcription won't be able to happen there. Now we remember that if lactose is present, what lactose does is it'll bind to that repressor protein and cause it to fall off. It'll cause some sort of shape change which will allow it to fall off. And now there, um, this will be available for the RNA polymerase to come in and allow transcription to occur. Um, and so a, kind of a challenge question that I wanted to pose based on one of the discussion quiz questions is why doesn't the repressor protein automatically inhibit the binding of the activation site? And what does that kind of mean for this regulation system as a whole? So if you remember the first question on the discussion quiz, it says the ability of the repressor protein to bind to the operon is influenced by blank, whereas the ability of CRP to bind to the operon is influenced by blank. Now, most people got this first part right. The ability of the repressor protein to bind to the operon is influenced by lactose, which hopefully makes sense at this point because we literally just said that. So the ability of this to bind is directly influenced by whether or not lactose is there to change its shape. And a lot of people, um, well, I think most people got this one right still, but a lot of mistakes that I saw for the second part was that people would say that the ability of CRP to bind is influenced by both. And if we didn't know the structure of the operon um, itself, then maybe that would be a tempting answer to put, because we might think, okay, if the repressor protein is bound, maybe it's somehow blocking that activation site. Like maybe the activation site is in here somewhere. And so CRP wouldn't be able to bind even if it's present or whatever. Um, but in this case, we can see clearly, okay, we know that the repressor protein binds the operator, which is located here, this little orange segment. But the CRP-CAMP binding site is located here. So whether or not this protein is bound, this can still always be activated by the um, CRP. So when we're looking at this part of the question, the ability of CRP to bind to the operon is only going to be influenced by glucose um, for reasons which we'll review in just a second, but it's not going to be affected by lactose at all because it has no relationship with this siding. Okay, cool. So just a reminder about how glucose affects the activation step is that um, glucose is an inhibitor for this adenylyl cyclase. Um, and if that reaction is inhibited, we're not going to get this CAMP level. And so CAMP is important because we need both CAMP and CRP together in order to get that activation to occur. 
So if you have CIMP alone or CRP alone, that's not going to be enough. We have to have them bound together into a complex. And that complex is going to be what activates this um, activation site and allows the transcription to occur. Okay, so yeah, ultimately we can think, okay, CIMP is regulated by glucose. CRP is not, but regardless, you're always going to need both of those things together in order for, um, in order for the activation step to occur. Okay, so I wanted to just frame a different way of conceptualizing this concept of dual regulation. Um, I think it's a little bit different than the way I conceptualized it in my first discussion video about this topic. And I think that's helpful because it might um, just pr like present you another way of thinking about this. So essentially what we can say ultimately about the lac operon is that in order for meaning like a meaningful level of transcription of these lac enzymes to occur, there are two conditions that must be met in order for that to happen. The first one is that glucose must be absent, and hopefully that should be intuitive at this point, because if we think about um, if glucose was present, it's going to inhibit that CAMP, which will prevent the activation, and the activation is necessary in order to get a high level of transcription. So glucose has to be absent, and the second condition is that lactose must be present, and that's because if we don't have lactose, then that, by default, that repressor protein is going to be bound, and the RNA polymerase isn't going to be able to do anything. So glucose must be absent, lactose must be present. Those are the two conditions that need to be met, which is um, when we say dually regulated, that means that there's two things that we depend on in order um, for transcription to occur. And those are the two things. Okay, so we were given these scenarios. Um, and in this first scenario one, essentially it's just functioning as normal. What would we expect for the lac operon under these four different situations? Um, we have high glucose, low lactose, um, low glucose, high lactose, and then high of both and low of both. And so I think a really easy way to go about this or to understand this is to just go, okay, these are the two conditions that need to be met. So let's just go one by one. So first, we just said that glucose must be absent if we want transcription to occur. So automatically, without even looking at the lactose levels, we can automatically eliminate these first two conditions or these first two situations from having high transcription because we know that um, the activation step will not be happening in these, in these conditions. Okay, so we can automatically eliminate those first two. And now we can go on to the second condition. We can say, we said that lactose must be present um, in order for the RNA polymerase to be able to bind to the DNA. And so now we can just look at these two situations we have left and we say, okay, when, it's, um, when there's high levels of lactose, that means it's present, obviously. So this one will have high transcription. And this one will not because this one has low lactose. So you're going to have that repressor being bound. So ultimately, the results that you get are going to be just scenario three, or just um, the situation three is going to have high transcription. The rest is going to be low. OK, so now moving on to scenario two, we're told that now we've mutated the repressor protein chain so that it's never going to be expressed, um, which means that regardless of anything happening with lactose anymore, the repressor protein is never going to be made, which is essentially just saying that we're no, the operon is no longer regulated by lactose anymore. Because under the normal conditions, lactose's only function was to get that binding protein off of the DNA. Now we never have that binding protein. So adding lactose isn't going to like hurt anything, but it's also not necessary because there's nothing to take off. So we're essentially just getting rid of that condition um, of lactose. So looking at this, I just crossed out this second one because um, it no longer matters anymore. So looking at these same exact situations as before, we can still do the first step the same. We know that glucose must be absent, so we can automatically eliminate these two because they have high levels of glucose, so that will automatically eliminate them. And then now we can say, well, that was the only requirement that we cared about because now lactose doesn't matter. So both of these situations now are going to be able to have high levels of transcription. Before, this one couldn't because, um, because of that lactose condition, but we just got rid of it because of that mutation. And so essentially, this one um, is the difference between scenario one and scenario two. OK, and then we have scenario three, which said that we are mutating CRP so that regardless of um, whatever's happening in the lac operon, there's never going to be CRP that's being made. So hopefully you can recall that the activation site required binding of the CAMP and CRP complex together. So in this situation, not having CRP is always going to prevent 
um, that activation site from being activated. And we can recall that glucose regulates CAMP, but has no effect on CRP at all. So now it does not matter what level of glucose, glucose that you have, because if you have a ton of glucose or no glucose, you're still never going to get that activation step happening um, because you don't have CRP there. And ultimately what this means is that obviously we can get rid of this first condition. So if you think about the second condition, okay, if we have no lactose present and the repressor proteins bound, you'll have not only that repressor binding, but you also will not be able to have that activation step because of this mutated CRP, so no transcription. But even if you have lactose, which allows that repressor protein to fall off, you're still not gonna have the CRP required to um, perform the activation step. So regardless of lactose levels at this point, you're still, not, um, you're still not going to be achieving that activation requirement. So what that means ultimately is that both of these conditions can be eliminated. We're not regulated by either glucose or lactose at this point, which essentially means that there are no conditions under which um, we can get this high level of transcription to occur. If you're not having the activation step at all, then that's never going to happen, regardless of what the repressor is doing. Okay, so hopefully that overview was helpful. Um, I highly recommend checking your answers with the key to make sure that you got the right answers from when you did this originally. Um, if you got some of the things wrong, or if you just remember being really stuck on some of them, um, trying to do them again after seeing this video and seeing if, uh, the concepts behind it make more sense, um, that will be really good practice for the exam. So thank you guys very much for watching and good luck with the rest of your studying.